Okay, let's start over again. Hi, my name is Scott Shadley. I'm the VP of Marketing here at NG Systems. The mute button on the speakerphone and I work not cooperating well. As you can see, uh, I work for NGD Systems. We're going to do things a little different today. Uh, generally speaking, you see just slides or just video, and I'm going to have some fun and do both in a unique and old school form of uh, technology called printouts. So we're going to walk through these slides. Uh, all of the content that I'm going to be presenting to you today will make available after the event, of course, for everybody that would like to participate and get that information. Can you hear me now? Good. My coworker saying, hey, guy, get your speakerphone working. Uh, that's the fun part about live, right? We got to do things a little different. That's why I don't like doing pre-recorded. It keeps it a little more engaging and interesting. I do see the question list on the screen. I am looking up just a little bit to see the monitor versus staring directly at the, the camera. So if I uh, don't make direct eye contact, I apologize in advance. So today we are going to be talking about taking compute to the extreme edge. Uh, NGD Systems builds a computational storage device. And we build these devices because we have this problem in the marketplace today with pain points. There's a lack of physical space and a lack of available power, a scaling mismatch, and a problem with bottlenecks. And the reason for that is, is we have a CPU, we have a whole bunch of memory, and we've got a ton of storage. Storage is great. We all love it. We all know it. We've had this big, huge run on it recently because of this wonderful new cryptocurrency called Chia. But at the same time, we need to be able to get away from the one-to-many and find a way to get back to a one-to-one -one type of an engagement. So we have an opportunity to simplify, but also avoid wholesale change. Part of the problem with the architectures that we're dealing with today is a lot of people come out with really new and innovative ways to do things, but you have to rip and replace. You have to do all kinds of changes to your systems. We don't want to have to do that. We want to be able to keep it simple and easy. So what we're going to do, is talk about the value of in-situ processing known as computational storage. What we're doing here is we're taking the, some aspect of the compute power that we know and love from Intel, AMD, the soon-to-be Grace, and all those other platforms, and we're moving some of that into the storage devices. We're getting a one-to-one -one relationship that actually brings additional value to your storage devices. And we're doing it in such a unique and innovative way that you go from having a whole 84 CPUs, or cores, if you will, in this rack of server, to the ability to add a ton of additional cores in each of the individual processing devices. Now, this particular example shows a rack of one-new servers, so 42 one-new servers using the fancy new enterprise data center small form factor device. And with our particular product being the highest density device in the marketplace today at 12 terabytes, you are able to get a whopping 432 terabytes of storage inside your solution. So each server is 432, which means you're getting a massive amount of petabytes to store into the cloud. And uh, it looks like we're having some fun. I'll try to move a little less because the focus is having fun with me today. So moving on to the next slide. What is it that we build for you today? We have an ASIC-based NVMe SSD, or you can turn it on and make it a computational storage product. We built the ASIC. It's manufactured here in the United States in New York out of the old Global Foundry tab that used to be owned by our friends at IBM. The entire firmware stack to make it an SSD, whether it be the garbage collection, the wear leveling, the ECC, the onboard RAID, all of the stuff you know and love and need from a traditional storage device is done in-house here in Southern California and the team. So 100% US manufactured, made, and loved. We build it in what you need, as in the form factors that we all have to deal with today. Whether you love them or not, you're going to be using them in your systems. So we have the M.2, which is very popular right now in the data center space. We have the EDSFF, which is gaining traction at the edge, and also in the space uh, at hyperscales. So our friends at OCP are driving that. And the ever-loving 2.5-inch SSD. That's, those are the products you like to see. Those are the products our customers want to get. So that's the form factors we put them in. Now keep in mind, this is an NVMe SSD. It's built on flash-based devices. If you want a different form factor, hey, let us know. We're a small startup. We can do it all. Uh, next up, in-situ processing stack. So this is where we get the bread and butter of what's unique about how we can actually help solve problems at the edge and help with digital transformation. We put a Linux OS inside the device itself. It supports containers. It can run things like Kubernetes support. It has a quad-core processor, and we even have the ability to add in uh, co-processing power with an additional hardware acceleration engine. All of this basically takes these three storage devices, which everybody usually treats as just somewhere to put data, and turns them into what we now call a computational storage device or drive. And that allows you to have a Linux subsystem in each drive as you're plugging it in to each and every server. 
So not only do you have just one CPU, two CPUs, a GPU, whatever you want, you also get computational storage. Now the question is, how do I sell it to you? So here is, let's flip it on me again. The M.2 comes in up to eight terabytes. It'll be 12 terabytes or more with our QLC friends. The two and a half inch drive supports a industry leading and phenomenally ama amazing 32 terabyte device, which will grow to over 60 terabytes with QLC for those customers that can handle and deal with the QLC engagement model. And we have the EDSFF, which is up to 12 terabytes today and will be over 16 terabytes with QLC. Now, you may ask, why is it one is 32, one is only eight? If you take a look at the form factor, that's all that's gating us today. Our friends at the NAND vendors like Kyoshia, WD, Micron, Samsung, and others can only make them so big. So each of these placements today are one terabyte a piece. And as you can see, I can fit eight of them on there. In that particular drive, I can fit 32 of them here, and I can fit 12 of them here. Uh, as the devices get more impressive and important and valuable, we can address that. Our particular controller, as shown here in the M.2, has the physical capability to support 200 terabytes of raw data behind one controller. Now, we do have blast radius issues there. I talk about ECC, have all those kinds of funds and conversations. But at the same time, we have the opportunity to provide highest capacity, lowest power, and most economically engaged SSDs on the market. And that's without even talking about computational storage. So if you need a good quality SSD and you need a lot of space, let us know. We can take care of it for you. And by the way, once you get the drive in-house, we'll figure out a way to make computational storage bring value to your solution as well. So why is it that we built computational storage? Uh, there's this lovely thing called NVMe. It's a wonderful interface. Even hard drives are moving to it because it's so much faster, better, stronger than SAS, SATA, PATA, everything we used to know and love. But when you talk about a transport, a transport is a pipe. It moves point A to point B, point B to point A. It doesn't matter how big the data pipe is, you will always have more data to fill the pipe than the pipe exists. Down here represents the equivalent of a 425 gig NICS throughput capability. As you can see, our devices match or just beat the minimum requirements to actually move data in and out of the box. This represents the leading competitor who builds a PCIe Gen 4 SSD, half the density yeah, it's Gen 4 versus Gen 3, but you can't get the data out of the box. So we do two things better for you from that perspective. We match the bandwidth of the data that's coming in and out of the device so that you can actually get work done more efficiently. And with the computational storage add, we reduce the data size. Think about all these cars going into carpools. That's the value that computational storage can bring. Stop moving raw data and start moving just the data that has value for you. Reason for that, 175 zettabytes by 2025. They actually recently revised that to over 225 zettabytes. And we can help with this because we're now making it easier to store the data because we have larger density devices. We can work on the data in a more appropriate fashion because we're using computational storage to take raw data and turning it into something useful. So I use all kinds of analogies when it comes to solving things with computational storage. I had my fun uh, time last night watching baking shows. So we're gonna talk about it from that perspective. I have all the ingredients in my kitchen to make a cake. If I want to deliver a cake to someone, do I haul the ingredients to my friend's house and build the cake there or make the cake there? I don't. I make the cake at home and I deliver the cake to where it's going. That's the concepts of computational storage. All the raw ingredients are there. Why move them all from point A to point B if I don't have to? If I already moved them from the, the grocery store into my cupboard, why do I want to take them all out of my cupboard, put them back in the car, drive them somewhere else to put them together? I want to fix and finish the cake, give me the useful information out of what I have in the way of raw material and provide that to the customer. So how does that work? That's where we get into talking about the future, past, present, and what's next. We had von Neumann. He's our very good friend, one to many. Von Neumann is great. It has opportunity to turn into one to one. That's ability to solve the physical space. I don't have to add as many CPUs. I don't need a GPU. I don't need to add in fancy other GPUs. Now, they all have their place. They all have their value. I'm not replacing them. I'm just not requiring them to actually work on the data in some specific cases that I will show you shortly. So as you can see, we have this wonderful opportunity to go from where we were to where we want to be with a very minor change. We're not doing wholesale changes here, folks. We're just making it simple and easy for the customers, you, and our customers, you, or your customers there, uh, their ability to actually take care of this information in a new and innovative way. So as we move forward, make sure I get the one and only piece of paper. 
This is the fun chart that shows you all the cool things that we've done today. So you can see we've talked to smart city folks. We've talked to CDNs and data centers. We've talked to autonomous guys. And we're, uh, yep, that's the satellite folks. We'll get there. We actually have the capability to deploy these things in space. So as you can see at the core of all of this is our controller, that Linux OS and the ability to support containers. And those are a few of the many different workloads that we've been able to manage appropriately and support with better response times for our customers by deploying them inside the storage device itself. So what does that look like and how do we deal with that? Well, let's get into that for you. This is my edge slide. I can do database acceleration with VMware. I have streaming services through a CDN that's done some additional work. We talk about machine learning here. I've got also things like AWS Greengrass for IoT and Microsoft Azure IoT. If you're going to do things with the cloud, you've got to be able to do them at the edge with the cloud. And we'll explain how some of those things work. And again, keep in mind, all in this fancy little computational storage ASIC device. So hopefully you guys are enjoying the presentation, a little bit of a different spin on how to do things. I appreciate your effort. Let's talk about our friends at VMware. So this represents an example. And as you can see, Dell EMC is involved because until recently, Dell was the parent company of VMware. We took a solution where we reduced 70% of the rack space required to deploy an edge analytics platform and the overall TCO of the box by more than 50%. And we haven't got that final number yet because we're still working on this project. But you can see what we've done is we've taken a rack level implementation and we're putting each of these database nodes into the controller on the device. So historically, each of these servers represented one node of the database. No matter how much storage you had in it, no matter how much processing power, each CPU was assigned a node. Because we have a CPU in each one of our drives, each of these servers now contains 16 nodes inside the server. Master, slave, vSAN redundancy. This thing is fault tolerant, won't break, and has duplicate data deduplication, replication, all that stuff because it's driven by VMware. And we did this project in cooperation with the CTO office there. And we've done a, a presentation that's been recorded and available online, both on our website and VMworld 2020. So what does it look like? Basically, you have the VM running everything in charge. It talks to each one of our individual devices. We're using the M.2 here for reference. Each of these represents a different node. We use a TCP connection to actually talk to in, in between each of these devices, as you can see here. And in this particular case, we have it running out to 16 VMs. And each of them run at over a gigabyte per second. So we have plenty of bandwidth for the local node to do work on the local data. And you can see here these lovely three boxes, which I will zoom in for you. Computational storage and the value that it brings when it comes combined with VMware, ESXi, vSphere, and BitFusion, and of course, I'm not showing any videos today. So if you want to learn more, feel free to check out our website, or you can send me an email. You can see my name down there, scott.shadley at ngdsystems.com. I'll be happy to follow up with any content that I'm sharing today in digital format. So CDNs. This is an example of traffic control for one of our CDN customers. As you can see here, at the top is the number of users that are added to the system to be able to look for and want to stream content. Down below represents the two latency graphs. The upper graph, the higher the number, the worse the performance, represents the hard drive and SSD implementation of today. This represents the SSD implementation. Not only is it lower, instead of getting worse over time, it gets smarter over time. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about this. But the idea here is, especially when it came to 2020, we have this problem where I want to watch something on my laptop. Do you want to watch something on your iPhone? Somebody else wants to watch it on their AKTV. All the same movie, all the same content, very different formats. And the bandwidth that gets that data there back and forth is also very important. So I have to somehow tell it which way to go. I have to implement stoplights, lane changes, traffic uh, cones, all that fun stuff, and make it a less complex construction problem. So before we had NGD systems, there it goes. We had this whole process. Step one, and, step one and three involved the user. Step two involves going out to a data farm of all the IP locations where that content's available, which one's closest to the user, all that good stuff, comes back into the system and then says, deliver from here. Lots of round trip, round robin issues that take place here when it comes to network traffic. So I'm not actually solving the delivery of the actual content. The content's still coming from a data server. It could be hard drive based. It could be 
who knows where. It could be on the cloud. It could be on a local server on the street corner. This part's not what I'm actually trying to solve. This part here is what I'm actually working on in this particular instance. Now, don't get me wrong. We've worked with a few of the vendors as well around actually doing acceleration here. But for today's purpose, we're talking about traffic. So we take two of our drives to replace the entire geodatabase, because again, very large capacity, average capacity, lots of space. We move them from an IP location into the traffic router. Guess what? It can hold a couple of drives. Never been used before that way. Take a couple of our drives, plug them in there, and now we can start to do all of this manipulation of where to get the data, all that was done on spinning drives, rotational latency, network bandwidth issues, sitting local in the system. It brought 50% or more savings, and it learned every time one of the database records got updated, the system was right there instantly indexing it because the application's running inside the storage device, not on a host system, not on a dedicated network path, anything like that. You're actually getting the data delivered directly from the devices themselves. So what's next on the list today? AWS, Greengrass is the fancy tool that allows you to take an IoT device and have it communicate with the cloud without a lot of effort and work. Well, what we've done, as you can see here before, there's still network traffic required. Everything that you do requires some form of network because you're traveling between devices to solutions. What we've been able to do is migrate the Lambda function capability from a network attached local storage device into the device itself. So what does this look like for you and me? So think about it from a perspective of, now this is not what I would classify a scale out as far as number of drives in a server, because this is IoT. This is the device that's doing the work on the robots, in the service trucks, whatever the case may be, that need to be able to talk to the cloud. Gather local data, no local compute required, direct connection to the cloud. So I actually have the ability to remove a remote monitoring station from a system because the IP capabilities of our device allow it to talk directly to the cloud and solve a major AWS gap problem, and it reduces infrastructure costs. And a lot of the times, these platforms that have to be that go-between are very cost-prohibitive, expen cost expensive systems because they have to be rugged, sitting out somewhere in a parking lot or anything like that and exposed to elements, so it costs more. The more we can reduce the infrastructure but still add the value, shows the net bring to the customer, if you will, of computational storage solutions. Microsoft Azure IoT, here's another fun one. So historically, you have an Azure cloud, it talks to a local computer, it has some storage, it has to do a whole bunch of communication back and forth. That means that this processor has basically nothing to do but transfer information to and from a storage device in order to get work done on the cloud. It's still a network traffic problem. Again, this is one of those where I'm solving a problem not necessarily by actually doing anything unique other than I can now have the cloud talk directly to the device. Everything you need to do is embedded in the drive itself. So instead of having to create all of these different infrastructures to attach devices, scale out, create new nodes, delete new nodes, all that kind of stuff, I can do it locally within the storage device and only have to have a very simplified solution that represents the host computer. We had one customer that went all the way to the extreme that this was a Raspberry Pi, this was our storage device. There was a USB camera attached here, stored on here. Our drive talked to the cloud and used AI in the cloud to actually watch and detect what's going on with that particular image. So we've had some great opportunities with this. And I do have a video on our website, which you are more than happy to go check out. What it will do is it walks through an IoT show that involves me and my friend Olivier. And what we've done here is we've actually been able to showcase that this is the host system's Linux command line interface. In our product, because it's Linux and it's attached to a Linux host, I literally just create an SSH window. I'm talking directly to the drive. My keystrokes are talking to the OS on the storage device itself. Whether it's one storage device in one particular application for IoT, or it's 24 devices across an entire server, or 800 devices in a rack, one host can talk to and command line control each and every individual device ultimate node control for the super users of the platform. Now, keep in mind, we want to make it seamless and simple for our friends out there in the environment. So this is the super user format. We certainly have the ability to create GUIs and other ways of interacting with our devices. It does not require you to be a Linux expert. That's part of the fun of our support team that we have here that helps generate all that product. So in the next opportunity we have is we worked with our friend Dan Pollock. He is the CEO of 
uh, data storage science. And he has a unique problem where he wants to help with e-discovery. So for those that aren't familiar with e-discovery, e-discovery is the ability to take digital content and find information on it. And this is very valuable for some wonderful three-letter companies back east, among other certain types of organizations. And what we do with this particular solution is we can take into our device PowerPoint, PDFs, GIFs, JPEGs, documents, whatever the case may be. And there's tools out there, off-the-shelf tools. We are not creating new tools. We're taking existing tools, and instead of having the host CPU ingest a PowerPoint file, read it, find it, convert it to text, and store it again, we're letting the device do it itself. So everything that's going into the device that's being stored is instantly recognized by the onboard OS, instantly OCR, optical character recognition, for those that are not totally familiar with this platform, and turns it into a text file version of that same document. Now that text file can be instantly indexed and sorted by the application user, so that if I have pictures of people's driver's license, marriage licenses, I have documents from 1902 to 2021, I can get them into a text searchable format in a much more efficient and effective fashion. And our good friend Dan did a video with us, again, available on our website, that tells you how he did it, and actually has a walkthrough demo that goes back into some more of that command line work where he literally stores a, data, a piece of data onto our storage device. The device itself uses some tools that are available open source or paid, depending on your choice, and converts that to a text file and creates the, the human readable version of that content. Everything you need to do, know and love, and how to do e-discovery. Now, I've given you some examples. I've breezed through them a little bit. We're about 22 minutes into this session. I am now going to give you the how we do it. So what we've done is we have a host system here. You have your x86 processor, our friends at Intel, AMD, and soon to be uh, ARM-based with our friends at NVIDIA and as well as ARM. You can add a GPU if you wish to do so to add some additional work. And you have an application, and you have a host OS. Our devices are communicated to over an NVMe bus. Nothing but NVMe keeps it simple, makes it easy. We use a special tunnel that uses NVMe protocol transports to allow us to communicate and copy applications from one OS to the other OS. Now, if you're using x86, you do a cross-compile, creates an ARM variant, and sticks it in our ARM OS. This ARM OS on our device is independent of the media management. So while I'm reading and writing data, I can work on that same data. And this is a very unique and innovative way. So this concept of computational storage existed all the way back to 2012, 2010 in some technical papers. But they were always trying to do media management and data analytics at the same time using the same cores. Our innovation and the reason we built the ASIC and the reason we've done the work that we do at NGD Systems is to give you independent access to that data. And it allows us to have DRAM available for both applications. So we actually have a shared resources platform. This computational storage drive has just turned into an onboard instant storage server. It's a great opportunity for a new way to look at, learn, and engage with these types of technologies. And again, very simple, straightforward. There's a very small host API slash SDK, pick your favorite term, we can give you what you need to support the opportunity to create this data path. But as far as you're concerned, your data goes in on NVMe, your results come out on NVMe. We're not pulling data in and out using some proprietary protocol. Basically, the idea here is if my host application is trying to search, and I'll use the cat picture because everybody loves cats. And this device has 2,000 different pictures on it. I know that 20 of them have cats. The only way I know how to do it today is to take those 2,000 pictures off of my device, transfer them out over MME, and let this host do that work. Do I really want the host of a Xeon server platform looking for cat pictures on Google because that's what a lot of people like to do? No, there's a better way to do that. Take that application, move it into the device, let the device find those 20 pictures out of the 2,000, and the output file comes over your standard NVMe as the results you're looking for. And it scales. So I can have 20 drives, 40 drives, 60 drives, doesn't matter. All of them can do that in parallel. So if I know three of those drives have it, but I don't know which ones, for example, that can happen, especially in data warehouses, I can let each of the drives tell me they have results or not. If they don't have it, they don't send anything. But what I'm doing is reducing the wear load on the NVMe bus. And if I put it over fabrics, all I'm doing is inserting a fabric connection right here. Nothing gets broken or done. We actually have partnerships with several vendors that help with uh, PCIe and NVMe-based JBOFs. So if you want to do just a bunch of flash or you want to stick it in the cloud, 
we can still work with that because again, everything we do is over and unique. We're not doing anything fancy, unique, special, different. We're just making the devices more capable of doing real work. And what does that mean to you and me? That means that when you talk to IT professionals, as you can see over here, right there, we have been anointed as the uh, market leader in computational storage. And we're not the only one. I wanted to show this because there are multiple companies that are doing this. There's several vendors out there. You can do a Google search on computational storage and a couple of them are paying to be top of the list, which is great. But we've also been awarded CRN storage product of the year for two years running to be in the top 20 storage devices on the market, let alone computational storage. So we're, we're best in class for computational storage. We're best in class for storage. And we do that because we're offering this KISS principle concept. Keep it simple and seamless. No extra work required, no hard times, no other issues that are having to be dealt with. And if you're wondering, is computational storage something that actually makes sense, is going to stick around for a while? Our friends at Gartner have called it a transformational architecture. And it's one of very few technologies that's able to bridge multiple sides of what they call their hype cycle. Now, as you can see, we're early on the hype cycle. So yes, if you'd like to use the technology, you would be classified as an early adopter. But I will tell you that we're in production with customers that are driving volume. So it's not as early as you may think it is. And here's a nice little quote from our friends at Gartner. Again, that's available on our site. So uh, I didn't want to take too much time. I know that on average, most people stop watching in about 20 minutes because if we've been doing this for over a year, we do lots of analytics. So we're sitting right at the bottom of a 30 minute mark. And I'm going to say, leave it with you as how can I help? I don't currently see any questions in the live question box. So I'll give it here another minute. And if I don't see any questions, we'll let you know that you've had some time back and my Total amount watched may be better because I didn't go the full 45 that everybody's looking for. So we wanted to make sure that we had some fun with this, doing something a little more innovative, keep it kind of new, fresh, different. I have lots of content on our website that relates to the Newport platform, which is here behind me. We have our original products that we've shipped to customers previously. So we've been doing this. This is our third generation of solutions that come from NGD. And we are shipping in uh, volume. We are recognizing that there is a semiconductor shortage in the marketplace today, and we are dealing with that in our own special ways. So we do have our lead times under control for now and availability of product. We sell through multiple vendors, multiple suppliers, and multiple uh, platform solutions. So digital transformation. I just showed you a hardware product that can make the digital world better, and that's because I'm actually doing something that allows software vendors, software users, and application writers a unique way to look at their data. They no longer have to move everything. You store it once, you read it never, because the work that's being done on the device allows that a raw data to be transformed into something useful, and you read results. So you store raw data, you read results. If you can't think of any way that that would be better suited in the marketplace today, especially with the edge environments that we're dealing with, just leave you with the fact that we are dealing with a lot of different unique workloads for this particular product. And we'll soon be putting products in space. Yes, the extreme edge. That's one reason I highlighted that at the beginning of the slide deck. So folks, it's been 29 minutes. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation, a little different spin on how things work. I'll let you have 15 minutes of your session back, and we will have a wonderful opportunity to follow up with you if you come to our website, ngdsystems.com, or reach out to me at scott.shadley at ngdsystems.com, and we'll be happy to follow up with you. So thanks again for your time today. I look forward to hearing from you. And if you have any additional questions, send them my way. With that, I will say adieu.